Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center, Ken Hirsch. Good evening, and welcome to Engage at the Bush Center, presented by Highland Capital Management. Uh, we're pleased to have so many people here uh, on the premises, and well, as well as on the live stream, uh, and we're also honored to be here with our great partners at SMU. President Gerald Turner's with us tonight, a member of our board, and his wife, Gail. Um, you heard in the video that he said this is the crown jewel of the campus, so I, uh, we now have it documented that that's um, straight from the horse's mouth, but we're fortunate to have a wonderful partnership um, with Gerald. As we start tonight, we do so um, with a heavy heart um, in uh, recognition of a, of a lost friend and professional, Cokie Roberts, who, was, who passed away, um, who was a dear friend of the Bushes, um, as well as a great American. She was here um, almost a year ago today um, in a uh, Engage event that we did remembering Barbara Bush, and uh, it's in her memory uh, that we persist tonight. It's a rare treat for us uh, to honor uh, another national treasure, um, Supreme Court Justice uh, Gorsuch. We're thrilled that he uh, has made this an important stop on his tour. Um, it, the conversation that he has uh, around his book um, reminds us what a great country we have with our constitution, our independent judiciary, and rule of law, which separates us from so many other countries in the world and makes this place really special. Justice Gorsuch, uh, has had a very impressive journey to say the least. He earned his degrees from Columbia, a law degree from Harvard, and a doctor in philosophy of law from the University of Oxford. Justice Gorsuch served in the Department of Justice until May 2006, when President Bush nominated him to the United States Courts of Appeals for the 10th Circuit. He was unanimously confirmed by the US Senate. After more than a decade on the bench, President Trump nominated him as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, and he took his seat on April 10th, 2017. Of course, uh, his, uh, he's an author of a terrific new book, which has just made the New York Times bestseller. It's called A Republic, If You Can Keep It. If you like additional copies, we have them on sale later on. We also have a rare treat um, to have him joined uh, on stage by another world-class legal mind and friend and board member of the Bush Center. Since he's one of my bosses, I have to speak glowingly about him. Uh, Larry Thompson. Larry's career has included extensive work in corporate law, private practice, government service, and academia. He served four years as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. Under President Bush, Larry served as the Deputy U.S. Attorney General from 2001 to 2003. Later, he served as general counsel of Pepsi, and since 2011, has served as the John A. Sibley Professor of Corporate and Business Law at the University of Georgia Law School. And in April of 17, if that wasn't enough to do, he was appointed by the U.S. government for a three-year term as the independent corporate monitor overseeing compliance reforms at Volkswagen. And so we have the honor of listening to these wonderful, wonderful Americans tonight. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Larry Thompson and Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. Thank you, Ken. Rarely do you get a chance to interview someone who you really admire most in your profession, and that privilege, thank goodness, is mine this evening. Justice Gorsuch and I have known each other for more than 15 years. Uh, prior to his elevation to the U.S. Supreme Court, we served on the Federal Judiciary's Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure. Very exciting position. <laughs> In that capacity, I came to see firsthand Justice Gorsuch's quick mind, kind spirit, and keen attention to legal principles. Those same characteristics are on full display in the justice's new book, as Ken mentioned, A Republic If You Can Keep, if you can keep It. This book is a tour de force of legal and constitutional analysis. And ladies and gentlemen, since yesterday was Constitutional Day, I can think of no better time to discuss what, what Justice Gorsuch calls as the greatest charter of human freedom the world has ever known. 
And with that, Justice Gorsuch, now that you have been elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court, how has your life changed? Well, before I approach that question, can I first say it's wonderful to be in Texas. <laughs> I miss the West every single day. And can I say, Larry, it is a privilege and a humbling one to be sitting here with you. Larry Thompson is a national treasure. Can we agree on that? He helped guide this country in its law enforcement and defense after 9-11, and he'll never take any credit for it. He's helped in so many capacities, including on the Rules Committee, <laughs> and he'll never take any credit for it. That's just who he is. But he is a gem of a person, and it is, for me, a privilege of a lifetime to be here with you. Thank you very much. Has my life changed? <laughs> In just about every conceivable way. Uh, I lived a quiet life as a judge on the 10th Circuit, a little town outside of Boulder, Colorado, called Niwa, uh, named after a great Arapaho chief. And uh, completely anonymous and very happy, I assure you. And I, I think I realized, Larry, that things were going to change at, at, at various stages along the line, but it really came home to me the night of the announcement. And the president wanted a surprise, you may recall. And it was going to be televised on national TV from the East Room. I think that evening I was photographed more in about a minute than I had been in my whole life combined. And Louise and I were secreted into the White House. Now, how do you get into the White House without anybody knowing about it? That's a trick. It turns out the kitchen entrance is the way to go. <laughs> we went through the kitchen. And it really is, as Mrs. Bush knows so well, um, quite historic down there. You know, there are still scar marks from the War of 1812. There are still chips in the marble from bullets. And the president was gracious enough to allow me to use the Lincoln bedroom as my office for the day. And I wrote my remarks for the evening at a desk on, on which the Gettysburg Address sits. The president knew that my wife's from England, so he allowed her to use uh, the queen's bedroom across the hall. <laughs> what a treat. We weren't allowed to call anybody, or almost anybody, but Louise was allowed to call her parents back in England because they figured, who are they going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> and it's late in the night over there, five hours ahead, and Louise calls her dad and says, Dad, you're never going to believe it but Neil is about to be appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. And her father says, honey, I've been watching the news. I've, I've got one of your news channels on and over here. And there's another fellow, and they're following him. He's a friend of mine, OK? They're following him, and he's driving from Pennsylvania, and he's at a gas station, and he's on his way. And I hate to break it to you, but it's not going to be Neil. <laughs> Louise says, hey, Dad, I'm in the Lincoln bedroom. I think it's going to be Neil. <laughs> My father-in-law responds, honey, this is President Trump. I think the other guy might be down the hall by now. <laughs> so a lot was changing, but some things don't change, like in-laws. <laughs> um, the, the truth is, um, I went from an anonymous life to a point where I, I grieve my loss of anonymity a little bit. You know, you're sitting in a restaurant, and somebody's got a, a, a camera out, and they're videotaping you, slurping your noodles inelegantly <laughs> from across the room. And, but I, I came to realize that when God takes something away, he sometimes, always, gives you something else in return, if you look for it hard enough. And what I got out of it, Larry, what changed for me, was I got to see firsthand how much the American people love this country, how much they love our Constitution, how much they care about it, and how much they want us to succeed. 
people come up to me and have for two and a half years and said, I pray for you. I wish you and your family the best. Thank you for doing what you do. I may have voted for the pre I may not have voted for this president, but I want you to succeed. And they do sweet things too. I get all sorts of crazy gifts. My favorite, my favorite gift might be during the confirmation process, one, one, one woman in Florida wrote, wrote in that she saw that my, my socks were falling down. <laughs> so she sent me a package of socks. <laughs> but, but for me, what really, this is what I got out of it. I'm on a flight between Denver and DC and I'm going back and forth on a meeting with all of those senators on and on and on for months. And um, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just, I'm doggone tired. And I'm seated next to a little girl who's about six years old. And we start going through some turbulence. And she leans over to me and she says, can I hold your hand? Oh. And so we held hands for about 20 minutes. And then the turbulence, we pa it passed. And, and then she said, now would you like to color? <laughs> and so we spent the next two hours with her crayons. And I was just totally anonymous and just a person with somebody very much like one of my daughters at that age. And it was just so joyful to me. And maybe the best part, though, was her mother came up afterwards. She recognized me. She had been seated behind us. And two weeks later, I got a thank you note. And it was a picture of an airplane and a man and a little girl holding hands. And to me, that's what America's about. That's what I've gotten to see. And, and that's maybe the best way in which my life has changed. Terrific. Mr. Justice, uh, why did you write this wonderful book? What prompted you to do this? Well, I don't like talking about the confirmation process very much. <laughs> uh, but that's what prompted me. Um, my predecessor, Ant and Scalia, smoked a pipe during his confirmation process. He was confirmed, I think, 97 nothing. My old boss, Byron White, I think his testimony lasted about 15 minutes. So did mine for the circuit court, if that. Um, it was a little different the second time around for me. And I saw during that process some things that concerned me uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, civics, civility, the separation of powers, and the judge's role under our Constitution, what I call originalism. I saw people who thought of judges as nothing more than politicians in robes. Uh, everybody said, now, you should respect precedent. I want you to respect precedent. Except for I got these three over here I want you to overrule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you better promise to do it. And then, of course, I'd go meet with somebody else, and they'd say, I want you to respect president, but I want you to overrule those he wants you to keep. And I think it's one thing to think of a judge as occasionally, because we're all human, mistakenly allowing your personal views to influence your legal work and, and legal judgment. And it's entirely another thing to think of a judge as somebody who should do that and does do that on a regular basis. So those are some of the things that I came out of the process wanting to talk about in my own way at my own time. And so that's the book. So speaking of civics, um, there is a really a terrific chapter in the book on civics uh, with some very interesting factoids, if you will. Tell us about that chapter and why you wrote it. Yeah, so you know, that was a spark, the confirmation process. And then I started really digging in. Where did all this misunderstanding come from? Well, wh where are we on this? And I know Mrs. Bush has, has written and worked extensively on this as well in, in, in her beautiful book too. But I was shocked. Turns out only about a third of Americans can name the three branches of government. Another third can only name one. 75% of the American people can name the three stooges. <laughs> We have work to do. And 10% apparently believe Judith Scheinlin serves on the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> Those who are chuckling know her as Judge Judy. Now, I love Judge Judy, <laughs> but she is not one of my colleagues. <laughs> um, so those are some of 
the reasons why I'm concerned. I think the separation of powers is vital to our freedoms. And if you don't know how the government works, how can you operate it? Jefferson said that if you expect an ignorant people to remain free, you want something that has never happened in all of human history and never will. I'm also with Webster on this. Now Webster said, miracles don't happen in clusters. And what happened here took 6,000 years to occur. A government by the people, for the people, a government in which we have come over time to recognize the equality of all human persons and their unalienable rights as individuals before government. And the government works for us. We're not subjects. We are equal citizens. And if something like that took 6,000 years to happen, we shouldn't necessarily expect it to occur on a regular basis. We should take care to preserve it. I meet so many young people today who say to me, Larry, that I don't need to worry about these things because I am a citizen of the world. I'm sure you've heard that. What does that mean? Now, if they're trying to tell me that they love and respect each human person and respect their dignity as an equal across the world, I'm all in. Agree with them, 100%. But if you're telling me there's nothing special about this country and the inheritance you've bequeathed in our Constitution and the Reconstruction Amendments and the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and I, I beg you to think again. Tonight, we're in a building named for President George W. Bush, who is a profoundly civil person. Mm. You have a chapter in the book on civility. Why is that so important in today's society? Yeah. So I, I tell some funny stories in the book about civility on the court to try and illustrate what I think of as civility. Um, you know, we, do we disagree with the Supreme Court of the United States? Sure we do, of course we do. You guys give us the 70 hardest cases in the whole country. <laughs> you make nine of us do it. Try and get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch, right? Of course we disagree, but we know how to do it respectfully, kindly, and sometimes have fun along the way. Right? We shake hands every time we meet. 36 handshakes, Larry, no matter how stressful the moment. Impressive. That's a tradition that goes on 150 years, maybe. Impressive. We have lunch together. Every day we have argument. Every day we have conference. Now, not everybody makes it every day, but we gather in the dining room to have lunch together a lot. Now, it's the government, so it's bring your own lunch. <laughs> We sing happy birthday to one another. We do Christmas carols, Hanukkah songs. We have trick or treat with our law clerk's kids. We flip burgers at the employee cookout. That's the Supreme Court I know. Um, and we have fun sometimes too. We have a lot of fun. A um, couple of um, stories. Um, so, one of the traditions of the court is that the junior justice has to throw a party for the new guy. And Justice Kagan threw a spectacular party when Louise and I arrived. She knew that Louise loves Indian food. And so she got a local chef who is really good to come into the court and cook for all of us. It was a lovely evening, fabulous. Out of the park, upper deck. Well, when Justice Kavanaugh arrived, I had a bit of a problem. Now, I've known Justice Kavanaugh a long time, and I've got great respect for him. But he's kind of a meat and potatoes guy. <laughs> the food was going to be boring. So I had to do something to spice it up a little bit. And so after dinner, I asked everybody to follow me from the dining room down to the great hall of the Supreme Court of the United States. It's that big marble hall. It's quite austere and imposing, and I think deliberately so, probably. It has a Wizard of Oz feel to it. And I handed the Chief Justice a checkered flag. Justice Kavanaugh is a huge sports fan, and he loves the Washington Nationals. 
and their mascots are four giant foam-headed presidents who race around the baseball park. <laughs> Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. And my wonderful secretary, Jessica, found on the internet that you can rent them. <laughs> so we had a race in the Great Hall of the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, that was one of those where I thought it might be better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> so, that, so civility, that's what I mean by civility, is that we can disagree during the day and we can have fun together at night. And I, I do worry, Larry, about um, especially young people today when I read that majority of them are afraid to go into public service because of the nature of our dialogue today. I worry when I read that a quarter of parents have moved their children from one school to another because of cyberbullying. Those are sobering statistics. Now, this is a republic, and a republic's supposed to be a little raucous, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the whole point is that we have a marketplace of ideas. That's what makes us strong, right? We're not run by one person and their ideas or one elite and their limited, limited set of thoughts, we have the benefit of this raucous discussion. And an elbow or two may be thrown on the field of play. And we're doing, we're doing better than we think we are, I think, sometimes. right? We, we don't have a, a vice president and a secretary of treasury going at each other with pistols. <laughs> That's good. That's something. <laughs> we don't have senators beating one another on the floor of the Senate with their canes. That's good. I learned the other day that People even ran for Congress during that period bragging about their right hook and how they would be a better advocate for their constituents on the floor of the Senate because of it. <laughs> so, you know, we're doing okay, but we can do better. And um, this is one in which we all live in glass houses and nobody has a right to throw a stone. And I think all of us just have to ask ourselves, when we're talking about civility, aren't we talking about respecting the other person as our equal? Aren't we talking about treating others as we would wish to be treated? Isn't that all it really is? I don't know when civility became a bad word, or when manner, we stopped teaching manners along with civics. George Washington, the father of our country, had to write down and, and, and learn the 110 rules of civility and decent behavior. It was a book written by the Jesuits in 1595. Now, there's some pretty weird rules in there, I admit, but there's some fun ones, too, my, my, and, and they're basically pretty good. My favorite is, gosh, I don't know the number, but it goes something like this. Do not be so strong in your opinions or approach your opponent so closely that you bedew the other man's face with your spittle. <laughs> it's a good rule. My teenagers would say, say it, don't spray it. <laughs> I'm not sure we need the Jesuits rules of 1595, but in the book I give the one rule that for me works for me. And it was my wife's grandmother who taught me this. And it's, it's really a play on an ancient rule we all know well as a golden rule. And it's just simply, she said, after a long life of ups and downs, she said, Neil, you're going to have regrets in life. Guarantee it, no matter what you do. You're going to do things you wish you hadn't, say things you wish you hadn't, and you're going to leave things undone and unsaid. But the one thing in life I guarantee you you will never regret is being kind. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Justice, I've practiced law for 45 years. Uh, I've been around, but uh, I really don't know anything about the inside workings of the Supreme Court. So, what is, what is it like? What is life on the Supreme Court like? Well, I think it's a lot like any other small office, as I've kind of described. I've given you kind of a flavor of my daily life. Um, it's a wonderful place to go to work. I've got great colleagues. 
and people say to me, you know, what's the, what's the biggest surprise? And I'll, since I've, I've, I've come back, I served there as a law clerk 25 years ago. And the honest answer is, what surprises me most is that there are no surprises. <laughs> the place has not changed in any way, shape, or form. I, I have a very vivid memory of Clarence Thomas when I was a law clerk. He's dragging a library cart, an original 1937 library cart to the conference room, piled with paper, because back then the court did everything on paper. And he, ha he has this wonderful laugh, if you've ever met him. And those marble halls, when he's laughing, everybody knows it, echoing. And he was laughing about something, and it just struck me. Here's this man pulling his own library cart to the conference room. And it had his name tag on it, too. And it was one of those slidey, like, third grade teacher name tags. You know, the white and black ones? And I thought, he, he needs a name tag? Somebody's going to steal his library card? <laughs> and then I thought, if, and if you're going to put his name on it, a slidey thing? The man's got life tenure. He's not going anywhere. <laughs> I don't know. That just struck, stuck in my head, Larry. You know, fast forward 25 years. And I'm walking out of my office, would have been Edmund Scalia's office. And I'm walking to my first conference in the conference room. And what do I see? I see Clarence Thomas, and he's laughing. And he's dragging that same library card, <laughs> piled with paper, because the court still does everything on paper. Yeah, it, the place is uh, wonderful in ways that it hasn't changed. Um, yeah. Along those lines, one, one thing I like to say about everyone, everyone wonders how we're doing on the rule of law in this country and the court, Larry, and, and I know everybody likes to focus on our 5-4 decisions and things like that, but I think sometimes we just need to step back and see that things haven't changed. And the place works pretty much how it was designed to work. So I, I have a few facts I'd like to share, if I might. We have 50 million lawsuits filed every year in this country. You are a litigious bunch. <laughs> and I'm not counting your parking tickets or your speeding tickets. That's another 50 million. OK, 50 million cases. Out of those, this is in the federal system. I know it well. It's even better in the states. 95% of those cases are resolved by the trial court without any appeal. Now, we both represented losing parties who thought the judge got it wrong, but decided not to appeal because he was heard. He felt somebody heard him, and somebody fair decided it. Got it wrong, but he had his day in court. Right? That's a remarkable testament to the strength of the rule of law in this country, I think. Then we get to the Court of Appeals where I used to serve for a long time. Only 5% of the cases get there. I used to sit in panels of three with judges from across 20% of the continental United States in two time zones. I served with judges appointed by President Obama back to President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Mm. One of my colleagues was appointed the year after I was born. <laughs> we managed to reach unanimous agreement 95% of the time. It's incredible. The rule of law in this country is strong. We focus on the trees, the needles even of the trees. So, and, and we forget this forest. So, so what about, all right, the Supreme Court? We decide 70 cases a year, as I said. They're the hardest cases in the country. They're the ones where the lower courts have disagreed. That's pretty much why we take a case, is because a lower court in one part of the country has disagreed with a lower court in another part of the country about the meaning of a statute or the Constitution. Why else take the case? And even then, we don't always take the case because most of the time, these things get worked out. My law clerks, like the great Toby Young, who's with us tonight, thank you for being here, will tell me that the circuit split is immature or it's stale. Now, I don't know how a circuit split can be immature, my children sometimes, know, or stale, let alone mix those metaphors, but they do in their memos to me. That's fine. So we take only 70 cases, there are only 70 hard cases a year worthy of the Supreme Court's attention in this country. That's it. And there are nine of us, not three anymore. We're appointed from across the entire country. 
though New York City is very well represented, <laughs> and Texas is not, and hasn't been. Um, nine of us appointed by five different presidents over 25 years. We managed to reach unanimous agreement 40% of the time in those hard cases. Now, I don't know if you can get nine people to agree on where to go to lunch. I think that's really impressive, right? That takes hard work, mutual respect, collegiality. That doesn't happen magically. And then you say, okay, fine. What about those five, four decisions that everybody writes about, clicks about, all that clickbait? Fine, let's talk about those. That only makes up about 25 to 33% of our docket. Last year, there were 10 different combinations of justices in five, four decisions. They don't all fall out the same way, not even close. And those figures, 25 to 33% for the five fours and 40% for the unanimous decisions have been constant since 1945. Nothing has changed. Okay, and wait, it, it gets even better and then I'll shut up. In 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had appointed eight of the nine justices. And if we're doing as well now, as they did then, almost all appointed by the same guy, I think we should be pretty proud of our record. Yes. We're not perfect, but we, sh we can be proud of the rule of law in this country. Yes. You're right about the separation of powers. Why is that so important? Oh, thank you, Larry. I, this, so now we're getting to the meat of the stuff I really care about. So everyone knows how the Bill of Rights contributes to their liberty. Right? The First Amendment, you tell somebody the First Amendment's important, they nod their head and they go, I agree. You talk about the separation of powers and they start dozing off. <laughs> right? High school civics class, if they had civics, which they don't anymore. So, but I really think that Madison, Madison knew the separation of powers was the key to our liberty. And that the Bill of Rights, while important, he didn't want to write the Bill of Rights. He didn't think it was necessary. He said, if we get the structure right, <clears throat> minority rights and interests will be preserved. And all the Bill of Rights are is just promises, right? They're promises on a piece of paper. And like any promise, it's only worth the enforcement mechanism behind it. And if you need proof of that, take a look around the world. Our Bill of Rights is excellent, but there are some awfully good ones out there too. One of them, I commend to you, is North Korea's. I'm serious. It's excellent. Go read it. It promises everything in our Bill of Rights and more. You have a right to a free education, medical care, and a right to relaxation. Now, I'm not sure how that's working out for the political prisoners there. <laughs> but those promises aren't worth the paper they're written on because all power resides in a single person's hands. Madison knew that to protect our liberty requires the separation of powers. That's why I am one-ninth of one-third of our federal government, which is one-half of the sovereign governments in this country, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, all this sounds kind of high school civics, and I'll be honest, it didn't really strike home and to my heart until I became a judge, and I saw what happens when the separation of powers gets muddled. And I see that people's liberties really are affected in profound ways. Let me give you just a, a few examples. What happens when judges ignore the law and start acting like legislators? The legislative process was designed by Madison to involve the people, public process. It's gonna be difficult. Two houses. He even made sure that because of the way it's structured, modern political scientists have shown us that it requires a supermajority to get anything done. It's supposed to be hard, not easy, right? And by making it so hard, minorities would be at the fulcrum of political power and be able to say yes or no. Majorities couldn't do it by themselves. They'd need extra help to get the bill across the line. What happens when judges take over that role? Well, for me, an example, one, one example among many, is Korematsu, mm. decision in which the United States Supreme Court 
allowed the government to round up Japanese American citizens during the Second World War without any kind of due process. The due process clause is pretty clear. You can't be deprived of your life, liberty, or property without due process. There was no due process in that case. Nobody could say that was consistent with the original meaning of those words. I have a young man who clerked for me whose parent, grandparents were interned. So that's what happens when judges start making things up and bending to popular will rather than doing their job, their unpopular job of enforcing the law as written. What happens when the legislature stops legislating and allows the executive branch to do that, delegates its legislative authority? Well, instead of a very public process in which we all participate and minorities have this special power, the executive branch is run by one guy. You have a king making your laws for four years. Do you want a king making your laws? Maybe worse yet, the king, as we both know, doesn't always control everybody in the executive branch. Right? There are agencies he cannot even touch, really. So you have bureaucrats making laws. People are accountable to no one. What happens to minorities and unpopular interests then? Well, we have cases in which these come before me. These are real cases that come before me in which veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder seeking benefits have a winning legal argument under the law, I think, as an independent judge. Or an immigrant seeking lawful admission to this country has a winning argument to this independent judge. But we have doctrines that say I have to defer to the executive branch's interpretation of the law. You're denied an independent judge. And who gets hurt in that? Unsurprisingly, the vulnerable, the unpopular, the pariah, the minority interest. Because they're losing the right to an independent judge and instead getting a politically accountable agent making that decision. I had thought Chief Justice Marshall said it is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is, not anyone else. Okay, what happens when exec, what, what, what happens, so that's kind of two, two angles. Uh, of, uh, of, of the triangle. Those kinds of muddling, what, ha what happens when the executive plays judge, we've done, what happens when it makes up laws? Well, let's do that, okay? The executive starts making up laws. This is another problem. Well, instead of laws being few, difficult, and minority protected, they come fast, they come furious, and nobody can keep up. I tell the story in the book of Caring Hearts. It's a small provider of home health care services in Colorado. And they were accused of Medicare fraud by the department. Said that the government said that they had violated a lot of regulations, regulations that the government was allowed to make up by itself without the involvement of Congress, pursuant to delegated legislative authority. Well, you know, you get accused of Medicare fraud, that's the end of your business, right? An $800,000 fine, crippling for them. Years of litigation go by, and what do we find out? We find out that Caring Hearts had abided all of the regulations that the department had created that were in place at the time it provided its services. The department was accusing it of violating rules that didn't even exist for years and later. It was making up so many laws, the executive branch, that it couldn't keep track. These are the kinds of problems that happen when we lose sight of our separation of powers. When the executive branch starts making law, when the executive branch starts acting as a judge, when judges pretend to be legislators. And I just say to you, the separation of powers, Madison knew was the key to your freedom. And like the rest of the Constitution, it's up to you to keep it. If the people don't care, it won't be kept. I think Ronald Reagan said, we're always one generation away from tyranny. So, Mr. Justice, I'll confess that I'm a big fan um, for lots of reasons, but primarily um, because of what you wrote before you went on the Supreme Court about originalism. Can you talk to us tonight about why that concept is such an important concept and briefly describe how you set, set it forth in the book? Sure. So originalism has is, is got a bad rap. I think, and it may not be the best term, right? The, the, the opponents of originalism call themselves living constitutionalists. That sounds kind of nice. I mean, who wants a dead constitution? 
right? And originalism kind of suggests, you know, oh, I like the 17th or 18th century. I like powdered wigs or something, right? And that it only respects the original constitution and not the amendments. Baloney, right? Originalist respects all of the constitution, including really our second constitution, the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th Amendments, and importantly, the 19th Amendment. So originalism is not about horse and buggy days. What is it about? Well, it's really a simple idea. Yeah, it's the idea that a judge should apply the words of the Constitution according to their original public meaning to the problems of the day. That's how the United States Supreme Court interprets all other written laws. I can cite you 100 cases if I can cite you one where the Supreme Court, unanimously, whatever, has said, that we interpret statutes and contracts according to their original public meaning, their terms. Why would it be different for a written constitution? Our framers knew what an unwritten living constitution looked like. England had one. They rejected that. They said, we're gonna write some things down. And we're gonna write very few things. And really, I think the living constitutionalist complaint is they didn't write what they wanted to write down. They wrote down very few, but they're all important things, every one of them vital. And so that's what an originalist judge really says. I'm, I'm not going to make things up. I, it's not for me to evolve this constitution however I would like it to evolve. Now, I confess, I didn't know much about originalism in law school because our professors didn't tell us anything about it back in the day, 30 years ago. I think the first time I really heard a forceful exposition of originalism was when Justice Scalia came to visit Harvard Law School and gave a talk about the rule of law being the law of rules. And he touched on this. Well, back then, the Harvard Law Review didn't even publish his speech. It had to be published by the University of Chicago. He was then a new justice, about as far on his tenure as I am now. But he caught my attention and started me thinking. Kind of like the separation of powers, I think what really drove it home to me was living cases and real people and their lives and what it means to be an originalist versus a living, living constitutionalist when it comes to real people and real lives. And let me give you a few examples. Living constitutionalists will take your rights away. They will take away the rights in the Constitution. I'm not making this up, listen to this. The Sixth Amendment says you have a right to a trial by jury of your peers in a criminal case and a right to confront your accuser. Now, it doesn't take much of a rocket scientist to know what the original meaning of those terms are, right? Yeah. I mean, that's not hard. Okay, but living constitutionalists at the Supreme Court of the United States have held that sometimes you don't have a right to a trial by jury. There are other things that are more important in this case or that case, in these circumstances, in those circumstances, a judge will do. How about your right to confront an accuser? For a long time, living constitutionalists at the United States Supreme Court held that you generally get to confront your accuser, but sometimes it's inconvenient for the prosecution, sufficiently inconvenient that we'll forgive them, so that a police officer's written report can come in evidence, good luck cross-examining that, and be sufficient enough to convict you and send you to prison for 25 years or more. Your rights diminished by living constitutionalism. Now, wait, there's more. It gets worse. Not only do they take stuff away, they put things in there that aren't there. And if you doubt me, look at the first time the United States Supreme Court really departed from the original meaning of the Constitution. We can all pretty much agree on this. Dred Scott. <laughs> Dred Scott, the United States Supreme Court held that a white person as a constitutional right to own a black person in the territories of the United States. Where did that come from? They said it came from the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause. Scour that document as long as you want. It's history, it's an original meaning, and you will not find that there. They made it up. Now they thought they were doing something good. As all living constitutionalists, their intentions are usually good. They usually think there's something more important. 
They would like to write a better constitution. They don't think ours is good enough. And then, and at that time, they thought they were trying to avert a civil war and keep the union whole. Well, judges make rotten politicians. And they got it wrong, 180 degrees. And instead of averting a civil war, they wound up actually contributing to it. So that's, to me, what originalism is about. It's about respecting what is and is not there. And it's respecting the fact that if you want to change the Constitution, we the people, those are the first three words of the Constitution, we the people can do it, have done it. It's called the amendment process. And it's not for nine older, I can say that now, I had a recent birthday, older people in Washington to make new things up and take rights away sitting in Washington, D.C. for a continental nation of 330 million Americans. That's kind of scary. Uh, Mr. Justice, you talk about a contemporary problem, I, I think, which is access to justice. And that's something that we talk about a lot in the legal profession. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, Larry's been a leader in, on this for sure. Um, and I admire his work on it. So he, he could probably talk about this even more eloquently than I. But as a lawyer and as a judge, I think we have to admit, as great as our system is, there is room for improvement. Um, as a lawyer, I couldn't afford my own legal services. And I really can't afford them now. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'll, re I'll represent you pro bono. <laughs> it takes forever to get to trial. A lot of good cases, people can't bring them because it's just too costly and takes too long. And a lot of people settle bad cases because they can't wait to trial. They can't afford the process to get there. We have something they call civil discovery, which takes forever, mm -hmm. asking people questions back and forth. And it's usually neither civil nor does it lead to much discovery. I know people call themselves trial lawyers who've never tried a case, but they can write interrogatories to one another in iambic pentameter. <laughs> when you get there, you don't get a jury anymore. And just about everything seems to be criminalized these days. Yes. So that's civil side on the, on the criminal side. Everything seems to be a federal crime. And if you think I'm making it up, I asked my law clerks some years ago, how many federal crimes are there? And they came back really quickly, and they said there are about 4,500 federal crimes, which I thought was quite a respectable number, especially considering that most crimes are state, right? 4,500 federal crimes. And I said, yeah, but what about that delegated legislative authority we talked about earlier, that stuff that Congress says, you go fix it, Mr. Attorney General, Mr. Secretary, Madam Secretary. The stuff they make up the agencies make, they get to write their own crimes now. How many of those are there? Well, it took them a while to come back to me then. And they came back to me and they said, I don't know. I said, how could you not know? There's a, there's a number, right? And there's got to be a number. And they said, actually, the people who counted it stopped counting it about 20 years ago. And I said, all right. Why do they stop counting it? Too many, boss. How many were there 20 years ago? 300,000. Now, some of them are terribly important, I'll acknowledge. But are all of those federal crimes really necessary? I mean, if, you're, if you sell mattresses in this country and you tear off that little tag, <laughs> you're a federal criminal. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's something called the Bostwick Consistometer. I talk about it in the book. The Bostwick Consistometer that measures the flow of ketchup. It's a thing in our world. And if your ketchup runs through it too quickly and you don't label your ketchup as substandard, you're, you're in big trouble with the federal government. You remember Woodsy the Owl? Give a hoot, don't pollute? Well, if you misuse his likeness, you could go to federal prison. 
I have law professor friends who tell me that pretty much everybody over the age of 18 in the United States of America is a federal criminal. <laughs> and I worry about a world in which the prosecutor can pick his person rather than pursue a crime. And I know you care about that a lot, Larry. Yes. So, despite the issues that you raise in your book, are you optimistic about our future? Oh, Larry, I'm, I'm wildly optimistic about this country. Um, I get to meet people every day, as we talked about at the beginning, who just love this country. And I get to work with wonderful young people who inspire me daily. I get to work with people like Toby. Turns out she's the first American tribal member to serve at the Supreme Court of the United States, we think. I get to work with people like that. My, my co-authors, um, Jane Nitze, her parents escaped communism, brought her to this country, Czechoslovakia. She wound up going to Harvard, graduating with degrees in statistics and physics as well as law, and then clerking with Sonia Sotomayor and me. Or David Fetter, my other co-author. His family's half Mexican immigrants and half Holocaust survivors. He saved up his pennies by going to Cal Poly as an undergraduate for his dream to go to Harvard Law School. Got in, graduated first in his class. These people care, care deeply, but I just say to the young people out there, we need more of it. Don't be afraid. Be courageous, step forward. Somebody has to run the place. And it all happens very, very quickly. Um, I remember when I was a law clerk myself, Byron White, and we're walking in the hallway of the Supreme Court of the United States where all the portraits of the old justices hang. And Justice White asked me, how many of these old dogs can you name? And I was honest with the boss, and I said, about half. And then he said something that really shocked me. He said, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, and that's exactly how it should be, and I'll be forgotten within a few years of my death too, Neil. And I thought, man, that is depressing. And I also thought he had to be wrong. I mean, Byron White was, for a kid from Colorado, a superhero. Grew up on a small sugar beet farm, graduated first in his class from the University of Colorado, led the NCAA in rushing took his team to a bowl game, led the NFL in rushing, was the highest paid football player of his day, Rhodes Scholar, first in his class from Yale Law School, Supreme Court law clerk, war hero in the Second World War, Bronze Star winner, Jack Kennedy's friend, and helped Bobby Kennedy desegregate the South before serving on the Supreme Court for 31 years. Nobody was going to forget Byron White, I thought. Ten years, he said, I'll be forgotten. Well. It's 30 now, 25, whatever. And I walk past that portrait every day, Larry, and I see people looking at it quizzically, wondering who the heck he was. The old man was right. But he wasn't telling me something depressing, and he wasn't upset about it. He knew, as you know, as I know, we will all be forgotten soon enough, and that the great joy in life is working for something greater than yourself, and that there is nothing to be served that is greater than this great experiment of ours, this raucous republic, our constitution. Yes, I am wildly optimistic. Terrific. Just as he was. So I have one final question. I have one final question, if you will permit me. You talk in the book about your confirmation process and the question that Senator Sass from Nebraska asked you, how do you want to be remembered? So Mr. Justice, after your experience as a lawyer, a judge, and now a Supreme Court Justice, how do you want to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered first and foremost as a good husband and a decent father. <coughs> after that, as I told Senator Sass, we remember presidents rightly, 
We elect them. They do great things. We remember the senators and congressmen occasionally. But we don't remember judges. And that's really as it should be. Because it's not our job to make things up or to do great things. Our job is important enough. It's, it's to hold fast, to keep firm this great inheritance, this constitution of ours. I mean, what, I can't think of any greater job in life than to be the custodian of the Constitution of the United States and to bequeath it to the next generation no worse than I found it. So how do I want to be remembered? I don't want to be remembered like that. <laughs> Justice Gorsuch, uh, this has been terrific. Um, as your friend, I want to thank you for your public service, all you do for our great country. I want to thank you for your inspiring comments tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we the people, Thank you both for um, a demonstration of why the Constitution is so important and why we're thankful that Judge Judy is not on the Supreme Court. Um, I want to thank again Highland Capital Management for being the generous supporter of the Engage series who makes it possible to bring this quality programming um, to this wonderful audience and, um, and to the community. A few very quick important updates. Next on our Engage series for your calendars, November 4th is the Laura Bush Book Club event with author Alexander McCall Smith. It is sold out, but you can live stream it at bushcenter.org. Um, also, we've added 